So, good afternoon. Uh, back, back from coffee. Thank you for uh, being on time. Sorry for the somewhat shorter coffee break, but we have uh, still a very, very interesting uh, session ahead of us. And uh, maybe just before, uh, just to say uh, thanks for, for the Schumpeter comparison, just for, I hope you're all aware that after he has been Minister of Finance, he became CEO of Biedermann Bank, and Biedermann Bank went broke soon afterwards, so. <laughs> and then he went to, to the US to teach, <laughs> to make up for the debt which he had accumulated uh, by running the bank against the wall. But thank you very much. <laughs> I will not follow his footsteps that much. Okay, now it's already a, a tradition that in the last session we focus, which is usually the last part, and it was also in the chart, uh, which was, was, was shown by, by Claudia in the beginning. It was the last box of statistical production, is na namely the question of dissemination, communication, and it was already alluded to also a little bit sharing. So this is always a tradition that we do this in the, in the, last, uh, in the last session, because it is an absolute crucial part and parcel of the whole statistical production process. But, as always, if you are at the end of the chain, <laughs> Uh, sometimes you're crowded out. That, as you know, will not happen this today with the timing here, but uh, it happens often that you're crowded out uh, due to lack of resources, etc. And so, um, but as, this was, as we always say, we see statistics also as part of, of accountability, of the accountability of this institution. I'll come back to that in a second. So it is absolutely crucial, and if you had... Back then, in 1996, there was this famous statement by, by Alexandre Lamfalussi, the first EMI president, so nothing is more important for monetary policy than good statistics. Usually we stop here, but if you read the rest, it says it is important for the analysis, for the decision-making, it's important to explain your decisions, it's important that you see how, what are the effects of your decisions later on, and it's important at the end of the day to be credible to the people and to the world, which we heard six, seven times before, trust. Uh, so it is, this is absolutely crucial here, and so I think that is, that is really important, this trust question. And there was just uh, last week an interview of two pages, again, by, by somebody who was mentioned already twice today, namely Andy Haldane from the Bank of England. I, I left it in the office, uh, uh, like all my notes uh, uh, for this session. I left it in the office, but he said basically, um, and there are data, there's data, the Eurobarometer from March of this year said that 46% of the Europeans don't trust the ECB. And that used to be 24% 10 years ago. And uh, it's not very different from for other institutions <laughs> uh, in, in Europe. So there is obviously here, uh, you could say Frankfurt, we have a problem. Um, and what he also says, and that's I think important and leads now to, the, to this session, that people cannot trust things which they don't understand. And so it's crucial to talk to the people, to go to the people. And you know, the Bank of England now does town halls and uh, sits down with the people in all parts of, of the UK and at least every board member goes out at least one once a month or twice a month to a town hall. Okay, uh, you can now imagine our, our, our board doing this, uh, that I don't want to uh, say anything more on, on, on this, but I think this is important. Uh, so that brings us to communication. And we are also trying to do a few things. Uh, Werner alluded to a few things just before. If you look over there, you see the posters which we have done first uh, 20 years of statistics, trying to pick out some of the, the large amount of information. We have now, you saw in the beginning, we, we did a little video. Uh, actually, today we publish a new, what we call insights. So every two months or so, we, we, we take one specific statistic and explain it a little bit. So today we publish something about corporate debt and corporate debt across the, the different Euro area countries. So we're also trying in baby steps. But again, I'm back to the crowding out story. We definitely don't spend as much as we should be uh, doing uh, doing on, on, on communication. So the easier way is then simply to invite uh, professionals and listen to them and hopefully learn uh, from them. And so I have uh, the big pleasure to uh, uh, announce to you really here a, a wonderful lineup um, of uh, three speakers and a discussant who will uh, look at different aspects of the question of communication. 
but also this sharing of information, which is also, I think, very important. It was also mentioned several times today that the sharing of data, the access to data, the access to data, not just by the public in general, by academia and others, is absolutely an important uh, problem and important challenge and important issue. So, um, uh, so we will have uh, Andrea Mechler. She is member of the governing board of the Swiss uh, National Bank, and uh, she has been, or she's back to Frankfurt. <laughs> she has had here... Uh, some time uh, ago, she was here at the ESRB, which you heard already today several times of the ESRB. She was deputy head of the secretariat of the ESRB uh, and is currently on the board of the, of the Swiss uh, National Bank. And she will uh, let us know. Uh, yeah, there, have, there were a few things which the Swiss National Bank had to communicate about, and so uh, we'll hear about data sharing and communication from the perspective of the Swiss um, National Bank. Afterwards, we will have uh, Alan Smith. He's a data visualization editor from the uh, Financial Times. So he will tell, uh, that's his job, tell us something about data visualization and, uh, and, uh, and the enormous potential today uh, of data visualization. You know, uh, we used to say, I don't know if they still say, that a, a picture says more than a thousand words. So there is a lot of potential to make data graspable by, by different uh, different audiences by using the pictures which these audiences uh, can refer to and also Eurostat I know is very very active in this area so we'll hear from a professional here and then we will have last but not least uh, Nicolas Veron senior fellow at the Bruegel Institute in Brussels and at Patterson Institute for International Economics in, in, in Washington DC he's a very prolific writer on uh, banking issues financial market issues so I cannot imagine that anybody has, somebody in the room has not yet read some of his uh, uh, papers on, on banking union and on, on other financial market issues. And he is so obviously a very keen user of data and also somebody who obviously would like to have more data. But I'm sure he will let us know uh, about this uh, in his uh, usual very, very uh, good uh, rhetoric. And then we will, have this, as discussing, we will have Brian Blackstone. He is Bureau Chief of the Wall Street Journal in Zurich. He has been also before here in Frankfurt, an ECB watcher. And I have to apologize that yesterday, Ms. Lautenschläger, in her speech, uh, and the three newspapers she mentioned, there was the Financial Times, Le Monde, and El País, but uh, she forgot the Wall Street Journal. Uh, so I, I, I do up for this now. So without any further ado, uh, Andrea, the floor is yours. Dear Oral, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. I feel we've had a number of very insightful panels today. Um, I want to take a, little, a slightly different perspective. We've heard about what new data is needed for monetary policy purposes. From a financial stability perspective, we've heard about what does, in what way data is changing. I'd like to take a more pure central bank policy perspective how do we communicate monetary policy? And what is the role, knowing the complexity that underlies today's world, whether market structure, economic structure, financial market, what is the role of data in order to support our communication? Eventually, what we need is what Oral said. The most important thing for a central bank is to remain credible and trustful. So. Let me give you a little bit of a background. 10 years after the global financial crisis, monetary policy in most advanced uh, countries is still in unconventional territory. Switzerland is no exception. But Switzerland, there are a couple of differences. One of them is we have a different monetary policy stance than some of our large neighbors. In particular, our monetary policy continues to be on the expansionary path. We also use different tools. We have, and this is what, uh, this is what we have here, let me go directly. We have two monetary policy instruments that we're using right now. It's the negative interest rate that we impose on banks' uh, deposits held at the central bank, but also our willingness to intervene in the FX market when necessary. 
Another thing, because of these differences, and as you know, we have a safe haven currency, which makes us much more vulnerable to excessive appreciation in our currency with direct impact on inflation. So that means our communication has had and continues to be slightly different depending on what we need to communicate. But one thing is clear, and that's been clear for all of the central banks, especially the ones very active in unconven using unconventional policies, is communication with the public has become much more important and much more interactive than before the crisis. And I'm gonna do here, divide that communication into parts. One, there is the need, as Oral said, the need to explain your policies, how they work, why they work and how effective they are. The other part is the part even before is the need to understand what is actually going on. And the main thing I'm gonna, if there's one thing, I know it's late in the day, the one thing I'd like you to take away from ours is, is the fact that for us, it's important to communicate in simple terms, in an unambiguous way, but in order to do that, we need to understand the issue at depth. And, it's, and that's where we use the most data and where we're very analytically focused. And it's that difference. How do you get the right balance on these two things? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a market that, uh, that hasn't been discussed much today. Usually we think about inflation or financial stability. I'm going to use the example here on the FX market, which is a very important market for us and is slightly different than, for instance, the ECB or the Fed. So I'm going to start with the second part. It's first, in order to communicate in simple terms, we believe it's incredibly important to understand well the complexity that is behind there. And in fact, our communication, as you know, we have a safe haven currency, our communication on the Swiss franc has been and continues to be crucial. And right now it's based on two statements. Our Swiss, the Swiss franc continues to be highly valued, and the second is that the FX markets continues to be fragile. And, and this is really a very important, two very important parts of our communication. Now, those are two very simple ways to do it, and it's very important that the financial markets understand what we mean. But, but first, before going to the communication, how do we think about it and how do we analyze it? And that's for us at the central bank incredibly important to really do deep dives into the data. I only have 15 minutes, so you can imagine I can only give you a glimpse. But here's one of the glimpse. So when you think about a central bank thinking of the exchange rate, you think it's all about the value. It's the level of the exchange rate. It's not. And in fact, this is what I'm showing here. So here what you see is the level of the exchange rate over 45 minutes. That's already a pretty long time. This happens to be on, on February 8th. I don't know if you remember, that was the day when suddenly, there were suddenly big fears that the, 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 the wage data in the US suddenly was much better than expected. So there were big fears that suddenly inflation might actually pick up faster than expected. So the stock exchange, the S&P 500s had a big dip. There was a big risk off environment and the Swiss franc got also affected. So this is just to give you one glimpse, 45 minutes, a pretty long time, but what that it's not enough to look at the level. In fact, the level is not that interesting. What's, here's just one other dimension. It's the, what we call the order book. So we look at how much, how ma how much there is of, on, on the order book, so on the ordering, how much buying and selling orders, not even the actual uh, transaction. The actual transaction, you may not see them very well, but there are a couple dots. The dots, not the lines, are actually the actual transaction, but there's many more orders on the buy side, on the sell side. And this for us is very important, and it's very interesting. And I'm just gonna, just to give you a little bit of sense how we think about it. So here you see an order book, the blue is the, the uh, the, the blue side is the buying Euro Swiss, the red side is the selling Euro Swiss. What you see is before whatever happened, so if you look at here from 4, 4 p.m. to 4.15, we had a very deep market and a two-sided market. The buy side, the sell side were both quite, uh, quite uh, deep. Suddenly there was, a, there was a noise in the market and what we see, the level changed. The level changed, but the order books continued to be 
quite filled. Suddenly, you see a change. The order books becomes much, much smaller on both sides. You do see something that's very specific to a safe haven currency when there is uncertainty. Suddenly, those transactions that remain, the actual transaction, are only one-sided. If you look at it, on, when, when you see the Swiss franc falling, the euro Swiss franc, it's only on the, um, you only see uh, selling euro Swiss, so i.e. buying the Swiss franc, but suddenly it self-corrects quite rapidly, 10 minutes into it. And then, you, and then the, the level goes up, but also the order book on both sides fattens up again. What, when we look at it, this was actually uh, a fairly good environment in the sense that at no time do we see that the, the selling and the buying interest remained in the market. So the market making remained both-sided all the time. So this is just to give you a sense that for us the level only gives you one perspective, but there are many other perspectives in order to understand what is in the market. Of course, eventually you need to go much further. You need to understand who's behind it, what were the, the reasons, um, uh, why did certain positions change. But the point is really here how important it is to go much further down. And I want to go here, give you a little bit of a sense. Understanding the depths of, in this case, the FX market is key for us to foster trust and, and credibility. Unless we understand or try to understand as much as we can the complexity, and I'll come back also the innovation that's happening in this market, it's very difficult for us to stand and make fairly simple statement like the Swiss franc is highly valued and the FX market continues to be in a fragile uh, situation. So here what you see, so what I just showed you was one glimpse about FX markets that goes beyond just looking at the volume of the price. So one, it is important to have a very good near-time monitoring of the FX market. That's important to implement monetary policy. This was true when, when in cases when we need to intervene. Also, for instance, when you do asset management, when we manage our reserves to make sure we can be as market neutral as possible. But that's not, that is not enough. What is important is if you're going to have near-time monitoring is to link it to more medium-term monitoring of structural trends. In the end, for a central bank, it's not the, the, the tick by tick, minute by minute, five minutes by five minutes important uh, movements that are important. What is really important is to be able to see when there is a class of investors that start, starts to change the, 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 um, the positioning. For instance, for us as a central bank, it's important to know who are behind. Is it corporates that are trying that are starting to change the hedging behavior? Is it speculative investors that are trying to take advantage of certain changes in pricing in the market? Because that makes us look at, for instance, in this case. The, 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 the role of the Swiss franc and how the Swiss francs functions in a very different light. And then, of course, there is communicating. But here, it's not communica communicating necessarily only with the public. I'll get there. For us, it's also important to be able to communi communicate at eye level with market participants. And in order to do that, you need to really be in the market. You need to understand the complexity. You need to keep up with the changes, like Sabine Lautenschläger said very nicely yesterday, how important it is if you want to be, if you want to remain uh, in confidence, you have to be able to speak the same language with all the people, with the algo traders, with the high, whatever makes the fast-paced market. So that is something that's incredibly important for us to even start to be credible with the market participants that deal in those markets. Now, what is one of the challenges that we have about data? And that's what I have here, is that how, first of all, it's easy to say we're confident. We also have to have a good sense, how confident are we that we're actually seeing what we want to see or seeing enough of what we're trying to understand. And here, there are many changes, and I think the two important ones. One, we've seen it in the previous panel, is technology has changed. And a very important one is the, is the one that I'm showing here, is the share of algorithmic trading in the FX market. So you can see here is the first data point in 2004, almost non-existent, and nowadays you can see that by 2016, 
almost se over 75% of all trades in FX markets are done through algorithmic trading. So that's a completely, so, so it, it makes it very difficult because it changes who's behind it, the drivers, how fast things happen, and it really requires a very different approach to understand what it means, and even to be sure, do we pick up all these trades that may be done on different platforms? So new technology is a big issue. The other one is new actors, and here I have another graph that just shows you, for instance, again, if you take the, the same period, 2004, you can see that before, most of the FX markets was done, or large part, over 50%, was done by um, uh, financial institution to which we had access, in this case, reporting dealers. Nowadays, much less than 50%. In fact, it's just about 40% is done by institutions to which we have access. The rest we may not even have access to, and it's done on different platforms, it's done on different venues. So again, for us, it's incredibly important to know the unknowns. Well, is it to know the unknowns or to at least have a sense of how much of the unknown is really unknown and how much do we know is out there but we can't follow it and how much do we actually, are we able to monitor. But this for a central bank is incredibly important work for us to do in order to eventually implement monetary policy in the best way possible. So this is just a couple of glimpses on how for us the whole data, the, the, the technological change and the new technology, the new actors, the new regulation in the FX market is something we really have to have to be able to keep up with the development of the market. Now I'd like to, to switch over to what it means for our communication. So communication, um, so communication, and I leave some of the nicest charts, I'm sure they'll come up for afterwards from the Financial Times, but for us communication, I think I'd like to come back, for us communication has several, it is about explaining what we're doing, and, make, and for this it needs to be fairly simple, and it is about sharing regularly our insights. So, because this is too small for you to see, but the graph, and you don't need to see the detail, a very important tools that we use is what is called a conditional uh, inflation forecast. And we simply use it in order to give our rationale of how we see inflation to behave over the next three years. But clearly, there's nothing mechanical about these developments, right? A, what is much more important is what are the drivers, what, are, what is the global outlook, how much of it is due to Swiss factors, Swiss-driven national factors that drive inflation, and how much is due from other factors. So in the end, we, can, we have a number of tools, um, our, our press conference, a certain a number of, um, of charts that we show regularly, but in the end, it is really about explaining uh, how we think about monetary policy. Here we have a couple of things. What is important for us are, I would say, three things. The way we think about communicating. One, it, it's important to be transparent. And what do we mean by transparency? Um, for instance, we have a large balance sheet. We have, it's all mark to market. We are very open, I don't know if you have, if I have some, well, no. But what is important is to be, I think I have one, but it's too small. I'll just show everything I have here. What is very important is we have regular data on our balance sheet. We have 800 uh, billion worth of FX uh, reserve. That's over 110% of GDP that we have accumulated in FX intervention. We're very transparent. It's all marked to market. Every quarter you see the profits and the losses, and whether you have profits or losses, they often go in double-digit billion. It's a very important communication that we have with the public. Um, we also provide, uh, uh, on a weekly basis, uh, the level of a total site deposit. That's a usually a fairly good proxy. It's not a perfect proxy. It doesn't give you all of the information of our intervention. So again, we feel it's very important to be able to explain it in simple terms, but you also have to, to be able to provide the tools so that it can be uh, followed. The other thing is we believe in one voice. We're a small open economy where the exchange rate plays, plays an incredibly important role, at least over the last 10 years with, where, where the Swiss franc has been under excessive 
appreciating pressure. So having a one voice from our board members is very important. So this is why you see we have different people. We're three uh, governing members on the board, and we all three have a single voice, but the voice is a unique voice because it has to be unambiguous the way we think about the implementation of our monetary policy. And the other thing is, of course, is how broad the type of how we communicate, or at least the channels of communication, have to be very varied, and they have been changing. Even for a conservative central bank, the way we like to think of ourselves sometimes, where we end up going, not only having press conference like every other central bank, but going into social media, having even a YouTube video, yes we do, um, in order to make sure we can communicate um, we can communicate to a variety of audience, audience, but always what I find is, is, is the trick is how do you keep the communication very simple. Of course, you have to do an incredible amount of work in the background. You have to publish some of this work, not all, but you have to go through the data. You need to, to have the best export in order to be able, in the end, to remain very simple. So this is a little bit, so this is my last slide. Again, small open economy where the exchange rate plays an incredibly important role. So if I think about just that part, the, the ones I've been focusing on the FX market, when you think about it, we have two major uh, statements that we have been continuing to make and we will change them when it's necessary to change them. We have an exchange rate which is still highly valued. We have an in a uh, FX market situation that remains very fragile. So in the end, we all know it's incredibly complex. FX market are going through a lot of changes. There are many drivers, there are external drivers, there are domestic drivers, there are the techno technological drivers, there are the actors that change. Some of the changes that we see may be, you know, um, can be driven uh, by corporate development. Sometimes it's by speculative investors. All of this, but in the end, we have to provide a clear picture. So then we use very simple, um, very simple uh, designed graphs, like for instance this one, which is, we, this is one of the way we've shown the highly valued. Of course, you can imagine it has many models in order to decide at what point and how long we believe the Swiss franc is highly valued. Many models that we run, but you can't show models. You can't convince someone. So for instance, this is a simple historical graph that shows where the Swiss franc on a trade-weighted basis was. Well, here I'm just showing the nominal exchange rate was in uh, 2000, uh, in 2000, uh, no, in 2005, and how strongly it has appreciated and where it is now. And for instance, for the fragility of the market, you know, we could show really an incredible amount of different graphs. One that we have been showing is to show that the Swiss franc continue really to have this safe haven um, uh, 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 feature in the sense that here it's risk reversal, so it's on the, using the option market, and the only point we're making is that even though right now the Swiss franc has been um, has depreciated from the most from the from its highest level, what we see is the markets continue to to position itself against the Swiss franc. So when when investors want to insure against a fluctuation in the Swiss franc, they're willing to pay still much more money against a sharp appreciation of the Swiss franc than a sharp depreciation. So we see that the market is still very much one-sided, even though it's an option that hasn't been exercised at this point. As soon as you have the slightest fragility, the market will shift, and we know in which way it will shift. And this is one of the ways we have communicated the fragility of the market. But I think this is an important complexity, is how do you master the complexity and in the end are able to explain your monetary policy in very simple, unambiguous, and yet transparent ways. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, for explaining us the challenges of a small open economy. I wouldn't say it's a small institution. You mentioned the balance sheet. has a very big balance sheet. Uh, <laughs> later on in the questions and answers, you tell us how you communicate with, with the algorithms and the machines. And 75% of the trading happens through machines. So 
I'm not sure whether they read your tweets and your, watch your YouTube videos. I should have said before, uh, I, I please apologize, that uh, Andrea is the first woman to occupy the board position in the SMB. Uh, so we have here uh, first uh, Mariana, the first woman chairing, Euro, sharing Eurostat, uh, chairing Eurostat. We had the first woman on the Bundesbank board just a minute ago, now the first woman on the SMB board. So also for diversity purposes, I think we have a, a good statistics here today. Um, now I move over to, to Alan Smith. Alan Smith, as I said, is data visualization editor at the Financial Times in London. But it may be also very interestingly here for this crowd here that he was previously head of digital content at the ONS, at the Office of National Statistics. I don't know if he didn't want to move to Newbury, or, or, but uh, he, he ended then up uh, at the Financial Times. And uh, he is, uh, always, uh, his task is always finding ways to bring statistics to a wider audience. So with that, it's the perfect person to tell us something about the strategy for data visualization. So Alan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aral. Um, it's so good to be here, actually, and to see a few familiar faces from my old life uh, in official statistics. And I have to say, it's not an accident that I went from the world of official statistics to the world of journalism, because I was very interested to see Werner's note about the importance of syndicating content to the media, because that's, for me, I realized um, a while ago that if you have the words statistics.gov in your URL, that's already two of the public's least favorite words. <laughs> Uh, in the URL, and so the media becomes an incredibly important part of the communication strategy for engaging the wider public. Um, and so th it, it was lovely uh, for the FT to invite me to be their first ever data visualization editor. Now, um, the, very early on in my time at the FT, I decided, well, we need to articulate our strategy for data visualization and what are we trying to do with it? And, and I kind of, I wouldn't say, I don't use the word strategy in its highest form. I'm really talking about strategy in terms of the patterns in the decisions that you make about presenting and communicating data. And one of the things that we'd certainly learned um, at the statistics office was that you should aim for impact. So I thought, well, I'm gonna try and aim for some impact at the FT and see what, where that takes us. Um, and so what does impact look like? So early on, uh, at the FT, I started to work on a story that was looking at uh, the changes in the US income distribution over time. And so we had some data here from Pew Research looking at 1971 household income um, in 2014 dollar terms. So um, poor households on the left, richer households on the right. It's just a histogram. And I thought it would be quite good fun to um, actually animate this chart to show how the US income distribution had changed over time. So the line appears to allow us to make the comparison. Somebody was saying earlier this morning about the difficulties of having reliable high income estimates. And that's where this chart shouts. Now, actually, it's a relatively neutral chart. There is no message in the chart that says it's good or it's bad. Um, but what it's saying is, look at how the shape is changing. So it's relatively ambiguous. Um, the interesting thing was, when we published the chart in the story, um, my main argument was to say that that chart's incredibly important to our story. What we were talking about is how the income distribution had flattened. And so the traditional middle class, because um, in the US, uh, class is based on income, um, had, had changed. What I didn't realize was how much this graphic would live a life of its own outside of the story. Um, and the first thing that happened was, I mean, I was new to journalism. I didn't know this sort of thing could happen. But the LA Times wrote their own article about my chart. Um, I didn't know that you could do that. But anyway, um, and because, as you can see from the photo, this was at the time and it seems like a very long time ago that Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton was the main political uh, story. But this was at the time of the Democratic uh, nomination, the race for it. And so income distribution was a part of the debate, so much so that Bernie ended up taking the chart and putting it on his Facebook page, which if you can look at the engagement levels on Facebook, 
just took this chart into this amazing space where it was just at the center of the debate about whether or not the changing shape of income distribution in the US was a good thing or not. And this chart continues to haunt me because uh, this was a little while ago, but um, just a couple of months ago, the North Korean foreign minister tweeted it at Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> it keeps coming back, right? Like, and so graphics definitely can create impact, okay? Um, and um, one of the things that's interesting about this particular chart is it kind of adheres to one of the other elements of our strategy, which is make sure you remember why charts exist, right? Charts exist not to break up a big page of text or to, to just lighten, you know, to entertain you, uh, you know, because your concentration might be sapping. Um, the charts were intro introduced uh, at the back end of the 18th century by a character called William Playfair. And I love using Playfair at statistics conferences because he said some fairly fundamental things about statistics, which I need to tell you about. Firstly, that I'm afraid the rumors are true, right? Like that nothing is more dry and tedious than statistics, unless you use your imagination and his imagination, because at the time, in this period in the Enlightenment, that's the only way that data was presented in these big empirical uh, tables. Um, and his, his answer to that was this, the first, the first graphics, um, even before Excel, right? Like this is, this is what, you know, and the most important thing is they were designed to represent financial data. That was their sole purpose. He actually called it applying geometry to items of finance. That's how he, how he, he designed it. And so what he said was, why is this a good thing? He said, this mode unites proportion, progression, and quantity in one act of memory. That's a really profound thing to say, and that actually is a couple of centuries ahead of modern cognitive psychology. But what he's saying is, compared to tables of data, charts really let you see the patterns and relationships in data much more clearly. He didn't ever say that it was a great way to break up a dull page. Um, unfortunately, the FT didn't really uh, catch on to the potential uh, of this. Uh, so this is over 100 years after Playfair's first chart. This is the front page of the first FT, and no charts, right? And also notice uh, lots of data. There's always been data in the FT, always been data on the front page, but you can see a pattern start to emerge here. This is 1888, 1901, 1931. 1955, that's when you suddenly see this amazing decision to put a chart on the, on the front page, right? Um, now, the problem is, when you realize organizationally that you've maybe been underusing graphics, the reaction might be to overuse them. Uh, and so this is the FT in, in 1999. And I always like giving my charts names, right? Like the income distribution is the shape-shifting income distribution. This is the testicular pie charts, right? Like this, this is... And going back to what Playfair was saying, is this memorable? Yes, right? You will struggle to forget this. But you won't actually remember the important thing. Right? Like, which is, what story are we trying to tell here? Right? Like it's been lost in the attempt, and, and this, the kind of, this, this sort of approach to visualizing data kind of imagines that regular people will find data boring. Right? Like, and that, for me, insults both the data that you collect and also the audience you're presenting it to. You've actually got to treat both of those things with a bit more respect. So what I've been trying to do at the FT is focus much more on graphicacy. Uh, graphicacy is a, a term that describes our ability to interpret and understand visual images. Um, so I would set this alongside literacy, numeracy, data literacy. These are the essential skills for modern citizenship, okay? Um, and the problem with graphicacy is it has fallen into the cracks of the academic curricula. Okay, who, who knows how to read a pie chart? Just put your hand up, right? Come on, right, pie charts, you can read pie charts. Where did you learn to read pie charts? 
School, right? Like, so how many different types of charts did you learn about at school? Maybe three. Pie charts, line charts, and bar charts. They were all invented by Playfair over 200 years ago. They're still good chart types. I don't want to uh, criticize them, but they are not the only way of presenting data. And there is nothing intuitive about a pie chart. You have to learn it. But it happened so long ago that you've forgotten that you had to learn it. So what we've done at the FT is we've created something called the visual vocabulary. And this is our attempt to explain that there is a grammar to the presentation of data in exactly the same way that there is grammar to the written word, and that there are different methods for presenting different types of data depending on what you are trying to show. Um, so just to zoom into a portion of this, it talks about what is the relationship in the data that you're actually trying to show. What, what's the message? Not what kind of chart would you, like, would you like, because that's what Excel asks you, and that's why it gets it wrong so many times. Um, we've translated it into Japanese, Chinese, because we think this is a really universal visual language that's emerging for, for working with data. Um, and if you want your own copy, you can get it from that URL. It's not behind the FT paywall. You can download it as a poster and do whatever you like with it. It's, um, it's there. But what I thought I'd do is show you a couple of charts that we've created using this framework for designing with data rather than around data, which is where the underpants graphic got it wrong. Okay? So this is a fairly simple chart. Um, the Dow Jones index, when it hit 20,000, and it's uh, the chart of the, the Dow Jones from its inception in 1896. Now, I am really sorry that I didn't know that Brian was going to be the discussant when I created this slide, because the reason why I think this is quite a bad chart, uh, as you can see from the title, um, because it's pretty good at hiding one of the most significant events um, in the Dow Jones's history, which is the Wall Street crash. And that was exactly the same chart that the, the journal put on its front page. Now, just in simple kind of chart design terms, the big improvement you can make to this chart is to use a log scale. Right, like, because a log scale on an index series, 1,000 and 2,000 is the same difference as 10,000 and 20,000. It's just the index doubling in value. And notice, not only does it bring the Wall Street crash into perspective, but it also makes the financial crisis much more balanced as a result. The, the, the most recent events seem less dramatic and, and so on. But even this chart is problematic because with a time series of over 100 years, we know that every single wobble in this line is a big event, right? Like it's, it's likely to be a recession and some other events that are associated with it, and we don't have the space to do it here. So on our visual vocabulary, we say, look, you can use a line chart to show change over time, but it's not the only way. And one of the other mechanisms we can use is a vertical timeline, which allows us to switch the axis over and turn it into a vertical timeline where every, so this is stretched out big. So as you scroll through this graphic, you get every recession, every event annotation, the serving US president, that's the Wall Street crash. Um, wait for it, the financial crisis uh, comes in, there it is, and a nice punchline that Trump is elected president uh, right at the end there. Um, now we tested this with readers because they said, can we, can we rely on readers to know that the chart is this way up? Uh, the response was phenomenal. They loved it because it allowed them to see more detail and depth to the series than they would in just the original version, which is fine for an overview, but not for the real stories behind the index. Similarly, I love this one, partly because there's a Frankfurt connection here. This was what happened when somebody, one of our banking correspondents came to me and said, we need a map. Uh, you know, I said, why do you need a map? And they said, well, we've got some cities. We, we've got some data about cities. Uh, and I said, well, what do you want to show? And uh, she said, I want to show which European cities are lining up to take over from London as the uh, EU's financial center after Brexit. And I said, OK, well, maybe you can do that on a map. And so this was a map that shows that data. And, um, and she said, well, also, I'd like to see which banks are most federated across Europe already. So which, which banks have multiple presences across the cities? So let's just have a look at it. I mean, I think you can probably see from the map that Frankfurt looks stronger than Lisbon, for example, right? So we can, we can look at that and see that. What about JP Morgan? That's really difficult, 
because you have to do what Playfair told you not to do 200 years ago, which is lots of remembering, right? So the visual vocabulary says, right, if you want to compare two things like that, put them into a grid, because actually the distance between Dublin and Paris doesn't really matter. Nobody's going to use the map to plan their holiday. Uh, it doesn't need to be a map because the spatial relationship's not important. And so in the grid, we have cities across the top, banks down the side, and they're, they're all in order. So you can see the strongest cities, the strongest banks, the weakest cities, the weakest bank. And then you can start to realize that actually it's a false thing sometimes to have this distinction between text and graphics. Good graphics need good text. And good text very often is improved by having a graphical angle to it as well. And the, the way that you bring those things together is incredibly important. So this is another type of chart that you probably didn't learn in school, but I think it's probably quite a good chart to learn how to read. It's called a Marimekko chart. And it again, allows you to see two very different things at once. On the top, across the horizontal axis, is the proportion of each country's GDP that was the size of their banking bailout. And the little shaded area is how much of that had been recovered. OK, so with the proportionally, based on the country GDP, what was the size of the bailout? The vertical axis is the size of the economy, right? How big is that economy, right? And so again, we end up with a very tall graphic that we've ended up bringing the text onto. And so as you go through this graphic, the story kind of writes itself. Right. The US was the only country uh, to recover more at the stage, certainly at the stage that we did this graphic, and that created that kind of memorable aspect uh, for us. So we've actually bolted this poster to the wall in the FT newsroom. So when people want to come and talk to us about graphical treatments uh, for stories, this provides us with a framework to change the discussion, around, to base it around what are we actually trying to show. Okay? And in turn, our readers have ended up becoming much more informed with graphics that carry more insight and more relationship. Um, in doing so, we've had to take on the very difficult argument, which is that some people have said to me, well, that's all very well, but a graphic is terrible if I can't understand it in five seconds. You know, it has to be simple and understandable in five seconds. Now, there are lots of times and occasions where it is important to understand a graphic in five seconds, probably uh, shorter than that. Like your car dashboard, you should be able to read that within half a second because you have to make an instant decision. But some graphics need to be read. Here's a, here's a five second chart. It's the votes in the 2012 French presidential election. You know, I can scan it very quickly and see that Hollande got the most, Beirut got the fewest, that's a simple chart, I can understand it. Uh, here's another simple chart of the 2017 French election, the first round. I can see that Macron won just a few more than Le Pen, and Amon was down there at the bottom um, end of that chart. Now, those charts are fine if all that you are interested in is knowing about those two separate events. Um, what if you actually had data that allowed you to get more insight out of it? How about the data that says what happened to Hollande's voters? The ones who voted for Hollande in 2012, where did they vote in 2017? Well, that's where you do need to create a more complicated graphic, right? It should still be clear the two opposite ends of this chart are exactly the same as the charts we've just been looking at, the votes in the first round in 2012 and 2017. But in this case, we can now see what happened to the voter flows. So you can see that half of Hollande's voters went to Macron, roughly, but the other half split between Mélenchon and Amon. And contrast that with how loyal Le Pen's voters were, that most of them stayed loyal to Le Pen across the, those elections. So this is a graphic that I would not expect you to read in five seconds, because I think it's worth spending a minute or two with it. And if you spend a minute or two with it, it will reward you with more insight than the originals. And that then leads me to the final point I really want to make, which is about visual rhetoric. It is wrong to think of charts fundamentally as an exercise in saying, here are some numbers. That is not the end point, right? Numbers are a vital ingredient, but charts really are visual rhetoric, visual arguments. And so if you start with a chart like this, which is just, here are some numbers, 
Here's a vaccination rate data. There you go, I'll put that in my report. That's not particularly helpful to anyone. To turn it into a visually communicative piece, the researcher should be brave enough to dare to interpret the data they're communicating and tell us what it really means. Why should I care about it? So just very quickly, let's see how much we can make this chart over. Well, that rate looks fairly high overall. There was a slight dip and a slight increase, but actually, if you zoom in, there was a very steep relative decline followed by a recovery. Did it just apply to MMR, just to measles, mumps, and rubella vaccination? Well, yes, because the other vaccinations at the same time didn't have the same trend. And in fact, there's a target for vaccinations to prevent epidemics. So we should put that on the chart as well. And then we probably want to explain to readers, well, why? Why did the rate change so much? And so we actually write. Remember I said writing is important. Write on the graphic. What happened? An article suggesting a link between MMR and autism, which was eventually retracted. And then you might say, well, so what? Just because the rate drip dropped, what happened? Well, more kids got measles is what happened. And there they are. That's the kind of impact of that. And then actually, MMR immunization in England is a terrible title for a piece of visual rhetoric like this. We should be actually making it clear, what is it saying? And when you put the two side by side, that's the difference that you should be looking for when you're using charts to communicate data. And this is the important thing. Not every chart can carry that transformation. So then question yourself, is it worth doing that chart at all? Be selective, pick the ones that have the impact. And so the most successful charts that we've done recently, they're relatively simple, but they've been worked over hard to carry that kind of message. Like this sort of chart here, incredibly powerful for us in terms of turning these charts into visual arguments. Just to finish on kind of learning more, because it was one of the things that I worried about a lot originally when I was at the statistics office, um, the FT have been stupid enough to allow me to write my own monthly column uh, where we post uh, examples of graphics and, and how we're designing and making our graphics. Um, we also did a reader event in January, which we might run again later in the year to, to learn more about this. But I think one of the interesting things is you've got a lot to learn from the people around you, right? Like, and one of the things, I was in DC in March, and um, the World Bank have got some amazing graphics. If you look up their latest sustainable goals report, it's absolutely phenomenal, um, and it, it applies most of the techniques I've just talked about there in the context of major bank reporting. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Alan, for this fascinating view, and also for the positive message, there is, there is life after official statistics also. <laughs> Um, now I turn uh, to Nicolas, uh, Nicolas Veron. He is, uh, as I mentioned, he is working for Bruegel in Brussels and Peterson Institute in Washington. So actually, he is a co-founder of Bruegel in Brussels. So that links him to this house because uh, Jean-Claude Trichet is his big boss, so to speak, uh, at Bruegel. Uh, he has uh, been working, also has been uh, working as financial policy expert for the European Commission, for the European Parliament, for the European Court of Auditors, for the IMF and the World Bank. And lately, Bloomberg has named him as one of the 50 global most influential people, referring specifically for his early engagement uh, or advocacy for the project of European Banking Union, which, as you know now, at least stands on two, two of the three feats which are foreseen. Uh, two are already developed. The third one is still a little bit limping. But uh, Nicolas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aurel, and uh, thanks for having me today. Um, it's a special privilege for somebody who is not at all a statistician uh, to be invited to speak at a statistical conference, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I also I'm more generally grateful for uh, Oral Schubert's uh, leadership uh, at the ECB in his capacity. Um, uh, he's uh, an independent statistician, so he's completely indiffer indifferent to praise. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I think uh, this has to be saluted uh, in the current uh, circumstances. So thank you, Oral. So the title of the conference is What Next? Um, and um, we 
have heard today is that a lot of great stuff is uh, in the pipeline. Uh, we heard about AnaCredit, to give only one example, which is uh, very directly linked to the Banking Union project. And indeed, the ECB has been producing uh, statistics since it's, this new mission was uh, hoisted on it uh, in 2012, uh, thanks to Orel and his teams and uh, uh, all, the, all the staff here, and with partners, uh, such as, for example, the Banking uh, Supervisory Statistics, which have been uh, produced since uh, 2017 and lots of other great stuff. So at um, Orel's uh, invitation, I am uh, going to speak about what I would see as the next steps, not only beyond what is already available, but also beyond what I understand to be already in the pipe. And as you mentioned, I care a lot about banking union. I think it's a significant new development, and therefore the natural next step to consider is bank-level financial and regulatory data. Uh, in terms of uh, public sharing and communication, so public disclosure by uh, the EU institutions, including the ECB. The importance of granular data has been mentioned several times today, starting with the video this morning. Uh, uh, Mrs. Marchese was uh, there uh, talking about exactly that. Uh, so, uh, so, so in a way, that's what my presentation is about, and I apologize that there is no charts or graphical rhetoric in there, um, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's a presentation about how to make the banking data uh, that uh, this uh, house and uh, EU institutions more generally provide to the public more granular. My perspective, obviously, is one of a practitioner of policy research at Bruegel since 25 as a researcher, Peterson Institute since uh, 2009, um, 2005, sorry. Or I said that. I also have to mention something I disclosed earlier, which is uh, my board membership in the uh, board of the DTCC Global Trade Repository, which is relevant in this discussion because it's very much about data and also investment in new fund, uh, private equity funds. That's not relevant, but it's a disclosure. Um, and also relevant here, uh, I've been together with Ted Truman in uh, Washington and a few others uh, very much involved in the advocacy for uh, Andreas Georgiou. Uh, Evald Novotny mentioned that this morning, trust in statistics is nothing if statisticians can be persecuted by their political employers at the national level. Uh, I think it's really important that all the statistical community continues to do what it has done so far, which is uh, display a very significant level of concern and mobilization in this cause. It's not an anecdote, uh, as uh, Mr. Novotny said, I think very rightly this morning. Uh, we can discuss plenty of technical projects if there's no integrity in the system. If somebody who has integrity is punished and lastly convicted in a near revocable way by the Greek Supreme Court to, uh, for jail, uh, there's little chance there will be good statistics. So, uh, so I think getting justice for Mr. Georgiou, this is the latest hashtag, uh, is actually a high level objective for everybody involved here. I think uh, continued efforts, not just by the ECB, but also by Eurostat and other institutions, are very important. So that was an aside. Uh, the, um, an important one. Uh, I, I will start from the Data Gaps Initiative uh, language. That's Data Gaps Initiative 2, for those of you who follow this, a couple of years ago. And there is a very important recommendation here, number uh, 2.20. Promotion of data sharing. So this is uh, obviously relevant to the title of this session. And what it says is the interagency group um, calls on um, agent, uh, G, uh, no, it calls the, uh, yeah, I, I, sorry, the, the grammar of this is not uh, straightforward. Yeah, uh, the recommendation is for the IAG and G20 economies to promote and encourage the exchange of data to improve the quality of data and availability to for policy use. I highlighted this, this is my highlighting. So G20 economies are also encouraged to increase the sharing and accessibility of granular data if needed by revisiting existing confidentiality constraints and I also highlight that. So this is very relevant to banking data and more generally to what is called in the jargon uh, supervisory transparency. So supervisory transparency can be about so transparency of supervisors about themselves, so for example, disclosing how the SSM works, uh, what's its budget, performance, staffing, uh, methodology. 
I actually would give the SSM very high marks for this. I've been reading the annual reports uh, every year. They're uh, actually very substantial. Before the annual reports, there were quarterly reports on the setup of the SSM before the SSM was operational. Uh, I'm not sure how many readers there were for those quarterly reports, but I can say I was one of them. Uh, and uh, they were incredibly uh, informative and uh, substantial and useful for uh, policy observers like me. So I think uh, the SSM can really be applauded for that. I'm not going to talk here, it's not even in the, uh, in the, in the slide, uh, about, uh, about transparency, about the, the, the job of supervision itself. So for example, if you take the critical SREP process of the SSM, um, the uh, supervisory um, review and evaluation program, I think, the SREP, um, it's for external observers, it's a bit of a black box. For the banks themselves, it has some features of a black box. I think that's good. And I wouldn't suggest that the uh, SREP, uh, that all aspects of the SREP methodology and certainly not the SREP proceedings should be disclosed to the public. I think it is in the nature of good banking supervision that uh, there is an element of confidentiality vis-a-vis uh, -vis the banks and vis-a-vis -vis the public um, in terms of what they do. If only for financial stability reasons, uh, you do, if a bank is near bankrupt and you have to act, you perhaps don't want to tell the public first, uh, but also for uh, reasons of uh, good operation of supervision more generally, because if you give the public and the banks too much information about how you do it, you create scope for gaming the system, regulatory arbitrage. That's a lot of the debate about stress test methodology in the US for those of you who follow this. And I salute uh, the chair of the SSM uh, uh, who has joined us. Um, what I will talk about, however, uh, is um, public disclosure of bank level financial and regulatory data. So that's the theme of the rest of my time. And there has been some of this. Uh, there has been uh, bank specific disclosure at the time of the 2014 comprehensive assessment, at the time of uh, every year uh, the EBA discloses uh, bank specific data for a number of large banks. How they're selected is a bit of a mystery. The number fluctuates over the years, but the very largest banks are always in, and that includes stress tests uh, on a fairly regular basis. And in addition, I already mentioned the ECB banking supervisory statistics available since 2017, um, but are aggregated on a country level. There's a little paradox here as an aside, which is that banking union is all about erasing national borders uh, in the Eurozone banking system, but the very value added of this statistical series is to show banking systems on a country by country basis. Um, there is a little cognitive tension here, but it's very useful data, I think. Um, Sometimes when I make this argument that uh, the supervisory system uh, should disclose more bank-specific data, I'm told, well, but this is um, a substitute for Pillar 3 requirements. And for those of you who know the banking jargon, Pillar 3 is this um, pillar, not of the banking union, but of the Basel framework. So Pillar 1 is a mandatory regulation. Pillar 2 is what the supervisor does on a discretionary basis, but Pillar 3 is a market discipline. So it's requirements for the banks to disclose to the entire market uh, some stuff about themselves, including regulatory uh, information and financial information, of course, and information about risks, uh, so that the market can discipline the banks and uh, both the credit markets and the equity markets can send the banks the right messages if they're not doing the right things. Uh, I don't think that's an argument at all, because I think supervisory transparency and pillar three uh, requirements are complements. They are not substitutes. Actually, when you look at jurisdictions where there is the best pillar three disclosure, they generally have the highest supervisory uh, transparency and uh, um, conversely. So the question is about public accessibility of bank-specific data, if possible free from vendor fees. And a lot of the bank-specific data, not all of it, but a lot of the bank-specific data that I have in mind here is data that is available for price if you want to pay you know, whoever is your preferred financial data provider. I think there is a very strong case for, the, uh, for reasons that I will come back uh, to in a moment uh, that this should be made public, uh, publicly accessible for the banks, for all the banks in the system, and by definition, that cannot be done by the banks themselves in a comparable format, so uh, that has to be done by the public authorities. I have no strong views on whether this is more of a job for the ECB or the EBA. 
Anyway, if it's done by the EBA, it will probably be data generated to a large extent by the ECB for, of course, those banks that are in the Eurozone. Uh, but, uh, but so uh, in terms of who has the responsibility for the disclosures, that's an important discussion, but not one that I will elaborate on. Uh, for me, it's really uh, a question of the European level of supervision, uh, which, of course, uh, is a slightly different consideration if you think Eurozone or EU20. 7, 8, 31 in the EEA, but, uh, but, but I will limit myself to the Eurozone uh, today because we are at the ECB. There, are, there is also another issue which is hugely important, which is the legal limitations. And I'm very aware that uh, there are legal limitations to, trans to what I call here supervisory, and I'm not the only one, what I call here supervisory transparency, uh, because there are countries, not all member states, I think, where uh, bank level data uh, is subject to legal protection in terms of confidentiality, competitive advantage, whatever. Um, that's not the perspective I take here, because my perspective is just what is the right public policy in this matter for Europe? And if then there is a choice of the right public policy uh, with the right trade-offs made, uh, then it's a matter, of course, for the system to deliver the right regulation and legislation. But I'm taking a step back here, and I'm looking upstream from that question of what's possible in the current, under the current uh, legislative uh, and regulatory framework. Now, you probably heard a very significant vote of confidence for the SSM that happened a couple of months ago. It's not yet fully implemented, but it's on its way, which is the move from uh, Sweden to Finland by Nordea, uh, the largest bank in the Nordic uh, European region. And some people said, oh, Nordea is moving because uh, supervision in Sweden is uh, tighter than in Finland under the SSM. Um, and uh, they, so that supervisory arbitrage, that's self-evidently not true. It's not true uh, here, uh, but I say the same when I'm in Sweden. Sweden and the Riksbanks banks are members of Bruegel, so I can uh, uh, be uh, even-handed here. Uh, and uh, what Nordea said is actually the opposite. They said not that supervision was laxer in Sweden than in the Eurozone, but they said all our competitors are supervised by the SSM. And therefore, that's a standard. That's a global standard from our perspective. If we want to be assessed properly by investors, we need to be under SSM supervision because that's a yardstick. And, uh, and that's actually, I believe, uh, for lack of uh, uh, a better hypothesis, the reason why they did it. So I take them at their words. There are other theories, but I think this is the most plausible uh, theory of what motivated the change. So by which I mean the SSM is the global standard. It has to be the global standard in supervisory transparency on a long-term vision. I'm not saying this should already ha have been done. I'm saying this needs to be considered. Right now, the global standard for supervisory transparency is the US. The US has something called the financial, um, Federal Financial uh, Institution Examination Council, I think, FFEIEC. Uh, and uh, they centralize on their web website something which is called call reports. And call reports are reports where, uh, so this is directly accessible on the web. This is just a, a screenshot. Uh, it's too small print for you to see what is being reported, but it's key financial data, key regulatory data, key risk data. So they have data on assets, profits, and the like. They have assets on regulatory ratio, capital, risk-based, leverage, whatever. And they have data on risk, for example, NPLs and uh, critical exposures. And by the way, uh, the, this report is not directly accessible for the, uh, uh, on the web uh, for uh, credit unions, which are the smallest banks in the US. But uh, I'm a client of a credit union, so I selected mine, which is, happens to be the Bank Fund Federal Credit Union in Washington, DC, known to some of you here. And uh, it's not on the web, but I received it by email automatically after less than an hour. So it's automatically generated, and it's accessible to uh, anybody, you don't have to prove your client. So it's the same report. It's a, they call it a cold report. It's a very complete report, and as you can see, or you cannot see because the print is too small, it's on a quarterly basis and it has plenty of uh, useful information. Now, that's in the US. If you look at the global level, 
there are plenty of vendors, as I said, which disclose a lot of information, and you can even say it's out there in the public space. So this is uh, top ranking by the, uh, uh, one of those lists which has a bit of uh, 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 notoriety uh, in, uh, in the professions, bankers, annual top 1,000 banks. And uh, they disclose some information which, you know, shouldn't be secret. Uh, as I said, financial regulatory information, but it's out there in the public domain. So, so the question then is, why is it that it's not out there uh, on the web supervisory websites uh, of Europe? What's in there uh, in Europe is just a list of supervised entities um, uh, published by the ECB. So as you can see, this has all the supervised entities, including the less significant institutions, LSIs, but, uh, but the uh, information about financial um, data is very formulaic. It's just a bracket for the largest banks of the size of their balance sheet for reasons of why they are considered uh, uh, significant institutions. And for less significant institutions, there is no information at all. Um, none, none whatsoever. There is just the name of the bank and the list of the entities, but no uh, quantitative information. Uh, the EBA, of course, has much richer information on the large institutions for which it publishes information. At this point, as I said, it's a sample that varies over the years. It has started to stabilize a bit, but it's still unpredictable, and therefore you don't get uh, excellent series. Uh, and also, uh, even that information uh, is very selective. For example, I haven't been able to find total assets, which is a pretty basic number uh, on that uh, data set. So what are the policy implications? I think having bank level data in the public domain is important for market discipline. Uh, as I said, market discipline comes with pillar three uh, disclosures by the banks themselves, but uh, this is a complementary uh, framework to pillar three disclosures. And increasingly, you get market discipline on your area base, uh, wide basis. I quote uh, Nordea again here. Uh, but this is also, market discipline is clearly, and that's in the Basel framework, an element of the financial stability framework. I will also say that with better market discipline and better transparency, we, sh we should be able to get better valuations for European banks. So that's a collective action problem. No bank has incentives maybe to disclose more than its peers, but if we have a high level of disclosure for all, as what I showed you in the US, um, then uh, there should be a better uh, valuation uh, behavior of the marketplace for all banks, and that should strengthen, not weaken, strengthen uh, European banks in the international competitive uh, playing field and level it, by the way, vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. My contention here is that U.S. banks have an advantage, not a disadvantage, uh, in the international playing field because of the high level of supervisory disclosure by the different supervisory authorities brought together in the FFIEC. Um, it's particularly important, I would mention, for the less significant institutions which have none of their data published by the EBA at this point, and so the LSI framework, I think, is a big, uh, important uh, concern going forward because my assessment, which is very judgmental at this point, is that um, the SI fra supervisory framework, the framework for the supervision of significant institutions, is much more tried and tested than the LSI framework. And therefore, if you want to avoid accidents or incidents, it's probably good to rely also on more market discipline in the so LSI space um, uh, as uh, not a substitute, of course, for good supervi supervision, but here again a complement. And importantly, transparency can help policy development. Transparency would enormously help awareness by the policymakers of gaps in the current framework. For example, very few policymakers in some member states, not all, know that a number of uh, Eurozone banks, including some significant institutions, don't use the same uh, accounting standards as uh, most of the large banks, which is international financial reporting standards. So some significant institutions and many LSIs don't use IFRS for their reporting. They just don't produce the numbers. There's nothing the SSM can do about it because this is a matter of legislation and regulation. Uh, it's crazy when you think about it. And needless to say, in the US, every bank, no matter how tiny or credit union, has to report under US GAAP. Uh, the same with auditing. Uh, and I think more generally, uh, transparency would support further steps towards uh, a more complete banking union. As you know, all of our political leaders say they want to complete the banking union, but at this point they're not acting on it, or else said there is only two pillars, and I would say even one and a half. The so one complete pillar being the SSM, of course. 
Um, and, uh, and to get uh, progress towards deposit insurance, I think we need much more transparency about what is in the system, what risks are in the system, what behavior is in the system, and that would dispel some false narratives that exist and that currently act as obstacles to reform. So let me conclude. I'm coming back full circle to uh, Data Gaps Initiative 2 and Recommendation 2.20. Um, we need good data. We need it available for policy use. We need accessibility. We need, if needed, revisiting existing confidentiality constraints, and I think that applies perhaps even better to uh, bank-level data than to other areas. Currently, the gold standard is the US. I dream of a world which I think is perfectly attainable where the gold standard uh, would be the Eurozone and EU. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nicolas, and for your, for your wish list, and also coming back and stressing very much the G20 uh, Data Gaps Initiative, which is very close to our heart, and also especially the 220 recommendation, which we think is uh, very, very important. In the meantime, I, it's my pleasure to welcome Danielle Nui, the chair of the supervisory board, uh, who joined us, and she will address us in, in 20, 25 minutes. But before that, uh, we still have a... Uh, a uh, discussant, uh, Brian Blackstone uh, from the Wall Street Journal. Looking at his CV, I would say he's always at the right time, at the right place. I'm not just referring to today's conference, uh, that's obvious, but uh, he was in, at the Federal Reserve when Lehman broke. <laughs> he was in Frankfurt between 2009 and 2016, so from TLRTO to uh, whatever it takes, uh, he had this all here live. And currently, for two and a half years, he's been in Zurich. I just say 120. It's so. Scaring Andrea Martin. <laughs> 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 no, 120 happened. <laughs> I, hope it's not an, I hope it's not an early warning indicator. <laughs> I'm a leading indicator. <laughs> so, <laughs> Brian, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I think it's uh, kind of fitting that I'm the last discussant on the last panel because usually when there's a conference with a lot of policymakers and a lot of statistics. At the end, when the lights go down and everyone goes home, someone has to write an article about everything, and that's usually the journalist. So fortunately, I don't have to, I don't have to do that because I get to speak about it instead. So I'll, in a sense, kind of read you my article, uh, at least about this panel. Um, it's, you know, I also think that it's a, it's a good panel here because it, in a lot of ways, it's the, it's the. It's the universe of people who sometimes are involved in the in the articles that I actually write. I'll, I would uh, go to a press conference or follow a speech by Andrea or Mario Draghi before or Ben Bernanke before that. Um, uh, I would talk to experts like Nicholas uh, to get perspective from my article. I would write it. I would propose some lame graphics, and then uh, someone like uh, Nick would say that's not, uh, or not, someone like uh, Alan would say that's not good enough, uh, we, need to, we need to do better, and it would be back to the drawing board. Um, I think that it, uh, you know, one, one conclusion I have on, uh, on a lot of the central bank communications, especially when it comes to uh, how statistics are employed, is that, it's, is that it's really difficult. I found that when I was, uh, covering the European Central Bank uh, during the uh, at the height of the Greek crisis, it's it's difficult to make simple declarative statements about what you're going to do. Uh, whether it was we won't make any exceptions for Greek debt collateral, or we will not buy sovereign bonds, or no member of the eurozone could could have a default. It's a uh, it can be difficult to make those kinds of statements. Uh, uh, the SNB is, is an example with the uh, minimum uh, exchange rate from 2011 until the beginning of 2015. I always actually had a very concrete problem with it because editors would say, how can I write about a currency that's too strong and write about the minimum exchange rate? So I had to find a fancy way to say that it actually, uh, find a way to say it was a ceiling on the franc's value rather than a floor on the euro's value. But when the SNB uh, dropped that, uh, obviously there was a lot of uh, uh, fallout in the financial markets, and these are, these are difficult communications to have with the public, and it's difficult to, um, 
sometimes to explain the underlying data that go behind it. Um, and uh, obviously not to uh, uh, turn it into a, a, a press conference with the SNB, even though I didn't go to the last press conference, so I get to ask all the questions now. But uh, some of Andrea's points, um, you know, uh, again, again, kind of highlight, I think, uh, the difficulties when uh, you're a, a central bank that's sensitive to the exchange rate. The ECB can have communications about, or the Fed or the Bank of England, about the inflation uh, outlook. They can, um, uh, they have a lot of forward guidance, they have their own forecasts, and you can put the economic data that comes out, whether it's an inflation report or an employment report, in the context of the forward guidance, and you don't get too many market movements, uh, maybe as we would have uh, 20 years ago when there wasn't as much transparency, when there wasn't as much forward guidance. When you're a central bank that's, and I, I've learned this in the last two and a half years when I'm in Switzerland, when you're a central bank that's very sensitive to the exchange rate, that becomes a lot more complicated. Um, uh, Andrea mentioned the, uh, the, 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 the Swiss franc, the, the assessment that the Swiss franc is, is highly valued, and uh, she knows I ask, I ask this every time there's a, an SNB press conference. Um, what does a highly valued currency mean? Uh, back in the old days, that weren't that old, uh, central banks and finance officials wanted a, a highly valued currency. Robert Rubin said a strong dollars in the United States interest. Uh, Jean-Claude Trichet said a strong euro was in Europe's interest uh, back, uh, back in the day. Um, so it's difficult to communicate what are, the, um, what are the underlying data that would show that a, uh, a currency is too overvalued or whether it's just highly valued, which might just be a, a, a fact of life in a, in a country. And, um, and as Andrea said, the, the, the SNB does pr actually provide quite a bit of information um, on its, uh, on its uh, weekly site deposits number that actually do allow you to kind of work back and say, has the SNB intervened or hasn't it intervened? I think that the expressing the willingness to intervene is, is an interesting dilemma for central banks, for the SNB, because um, you know, there have been times when the SNB has actually publicly said, we intervene in the, financial, in the, in the currency markets uh, the day after Brexit. But there's a balance, because if you share too much about when you're going to intervene, or when you did, then, uh, then silence might be misinterpreted by the financial markets and signal something that you didn't mean to, to intend. So I guess what I'm trying to say there is that, that there's, there's a lot of challenges that are exacerbated when a central bank is very sensitive to the exchange rate um, as, we're seeing, uh, as we're seeing in Switzerland now. And I think that's an added dilemma that in some ways the um, uh, the ECB and other central banks don't have right now. Um, and one other, just sharing a little bit of, uh, you know, of the Swiss perspective, um, another kind of area where, um, you know, the communications and the mixture of how to communicate data, I think, were, were pretty relevant was in, the, in, the, in the recent um, sovereign money referendum in Switzerland, which had a lot of interest uh, overseas. My editors were interested in it. Uh, the, the FT uh, people were interested in it. And this got to a very basic concept of uh, what is money uh, and who creates it and how much is there. And it was a little bit humbling for me because when I was working on this and having covered central banks for an awfully long time, I didn't really know how money was created. So when I had the graphics editor uh, ask me, um, could we do a, a, little, a little visual chart showing how money is created now and how it would be created under the initiative, I had to go back and redo my article because I realized I hadn't even explained it because I still wasn't sure. Um, but it was, a, it was, an, and it was a, a dilemma, I think, also for the Swiss National Bank because, uh, and this is something that central banks are having to do more and more, it's not just a Swiss issue, of central banks getting involved in, 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 in political debates. And so in this case, it was a, I, I think by the SNB standards, a quite vigorous uh, opposition. If, if, you, if you read some of Andrea's speeches, Thomas Jordan's speeches, uh, it, it was a position that the SNB was not used to being in, and it was very interesting for me to follow that, and to then have to go to the data and to find 
Uh, how is money created by the banks? Where is the data from the Swiss National Bank that shows this? And how do I package it together so that I'm not just showing one lame line or bar chart that doesn't really uh, add much uh, for the reader? So that was kind of a, a, a very concrete example, I think, of this intersection of, um, of, of, of data and policy making and the reporters who have to um, uh, make sense of it all and also uh, have it published on various platforms where people are reading the stories in a fraction of the time maybe that they used to when they would open it up in the in the newspaper. Um, one other, uh, so I think one thing that would be interesting would just be what some of the lessons learned from central banks have been when it comes to some of these uh, communications problems that they've had because in some ways the simpler the communication is and the more confidence it can instill in the short term, the more difficult it is to unwind it and the more the potential for financial market disruptions are if a central bank has to take a very simple declaration and say that no longer holds anymore, whether it's the SNB, whether it's the European Central Bank, or whether it's the Federal Reserve during the, uh, during the Lehman crisis. Um, on Nicholas's points, it, you know, I think it was clear that it, um, you know, that he's pushing the ECB to raise its game on banking statistics, and I think the challenge here is the there's so there's such a richness of data out there when it comes to banking in real time. The question is, how do you distill it and convey it so that it so that it tells people something that they need to know? Um, because you could come up with. I remember just during. Uh, during the uh, during the debt crisis, this had this this wasn't necessarily banking statistics, but there would be different times when there'd be kind of a flavor of the month when it came to economic statistics. I remember uh, at one time it was the uh, private sector loan rates within different eurozone countries because it would show that a a small business in Germany was paying a lot lower interest rate than a small business in Spain or Italy. Uh, you know, a few years ago, you know, Target 2 was all the rage. And then it comes, it's still all the rage, exactly. These, and these things would, these things would come and go. Um, but it's clear that when it comes to the, the, the sources of data that we can get from the banks uh, that can maybe provide real-time um, warning signals, um, it could be quite useful that the challenge is there's so much out there that how do you, um, uh, how do you convey it to people in a way that they, um, you know, that they can, that they can understand it and they can relate to it. Uh, on, on, uh, on Alan's uh, comments, I was, uh, I was glad that he did uh, include um, uh, one page from the Wall Street Journal, so he, he made up for uh, Sabine Lautenschlager's uh, <laughs> comments last night, um, but uh, you know, I, and, and, and it, and it, you know, and it, 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 it reminds me a lot of the interactions that I have with uh, with uh, with my own uh, graphics team because it's a I am one of those people that will send uh, five data points in an Excel spreadsheet and say, why don't you just put a bar chart there? Uh, because the way we used to think about it would be. You know, I'd do the reporting for the story, I'd do the writing for the story, I'd file it, it would be edited, maybe it would be, be getting close to being published, and then they say, oh wait, what are we going to do on graphics? And I'd go to imf.org, look, look on the statistics database, and, and, and try to find some data that would, uh, that would help me. Or I'd go to the ECB balance sheet data, or Eurostat, uh, or uh, now the SNB's website. And now it's obviously uh, something that if you don't have a, a good vision for what the, for what the graphics are going to be in an article and how it's going to work both in print and uh, and mobile, then um, then your then your story is not going to get the um, you know not not going to get the attention that uh, uh, that it should have. My I think the balance there is having um, visuals like the one on the on the vaccination rates that are that are so detailed and uh, and so um, uh, and provide so much information that as the reporter I might say, well, why would anybody even want to read my article after they've read the graphic? So that's, a, uh, <laughs> that's always a challenge for us too. Anyways, those are my comments. Thank you very much. Okay.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Brian, also for this very, very open and honest uh, words about the world of journalism. So I suggest we, we collect uh, quickly a, a few questions and then let everybody... Andrea wants to react immediately. Uh, no, mm -hmm. I, 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 was, I thought Brian had a very nice framing and some of the lessons learned. Um, and maybe I could just say a few words on the lesson learned. Uh, maybe someone else, and then is, is that okay? Because it's, it's actually quite um, short, but what, what I was thinking also with, as I was pre preparing for my um, thinking, I think, and, and, it, and it is something that among central banks, and we ask quite a bit about going forward because we're still in a normalization, and what does it mean? I think there are a couple of lessons learned, and, and if you think of the world 10 years ago, one is the policy tools need to be simple, you need to be able to explain them in a simple way. And I think that, that I think going forward, it wouldn't surprise me that the way we even think about monetary policy, the tools need to be simple. We have to answer the questions. And I think every press conference shows it, how important it is to answer the question. You have to be focused in what you want to say. If I think about the initiative on the, on the, on the full money, you know, you had to figure out what are the two things you want to say. For instance, in our case was the referendum, whatever the objective it says it will achieve, will not be achieved, and, uh, and it will have an impact on our ability to implement monetary policy. That's it. You have to be able to put them in a nutshell. And the last thing is, but in the end, we are policymakers. In the end, we are a central bank. We have to do what we have to do. No matter what financial markets are going to react or not react, in the end, there is a reality. We have a mandate, and we have to fulfill that mandate. So that would be just my quick lessons. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. So now we give a Hans Helmut.